Welcome again, Best of Trekkers! We've got a couple of pilots amongst other episodes in our block today. This is Best of Trek, Worst of Trek. I'm your host, Dustin Wing. Starting us off today at 151, change of status, or when it rains. One of many parts leading to the finale of DS9. Win laments killing Sobor. Kira, Odo, and Garrick take a little trip to bolster the new Cardassian resistance. Oh, the irony of Kira teaching the Cardis how to be resistance fighters without ever using the term spoonhead. Most notably, Gowron shows up on the front lines to take general command from Martok and try and commit Klingon forces to winning the war by themselves. Especially since they're currently the only thing standing between the Breen energy weapon and control of the Alpha Quadrant. Martok dares not speak up, but Worf won't take this one lying down and takes his first steps to doing his own show, Kung Fu, The Worf Continues. So many great plots get furtherance here, centering in on the end of DS9. Playing with time crystals at 150. Nostalgia and shenanigans. Or trials and tribulations. We're introduced to the Federation's time shenanigan police, temporal investigations, at the beginning of this one, as Cisco has some splainin' to do after their recent blast to the past. While returning an orb of the prophets to the Bajorans, it turns out to be the Orb of Time and an old Klingon adversary of Kirk's that happens to be on board takes advantage of the situation to put wrong what once went right. And of course, we end up in the middle of possibly TOS's most iconic episode, Trouble with Tribbles. And Darwin tries to blow Kirk up with an explosive Tribble, which I have to admit would have been hilarious to see on screen. This is an episode where getting through the rather simple plot is definitely more than half the fun. Using some fun Forrest Gump-style compositing to add the DS9 crew to original footage is done brilliantly. I know some will say this is a top 10 episode of all time in Trek, but for me, you can't have a perfect episode that tries to hang the bulk of its run on nostalgic callbacks. This is an absolutely incredible episode, but I think the TOS episode it draws on is better on its own. Though don't sleep on this one, it will keep you entertained all the way through. Not falling through the floor at 149, gone tomorrow, or the next phase. While trying to help a Romulan scout ship battle damaged and off course, Jordy and Roe are seemingly lost in a transporter accident. The rest of the episode is spent with the two wandering around the ship, seemingly as ghosts, trying to make sense of their new ascended status. In their investigation, it turns out they're not dead, they're just phased from a Romulan experiment gone wrong. And they can walk through walls, but for some reason don't go through the floor. They manage to force Data to figure out what's going on, and get re-phased. This is a purely fun sci-fi trope of people not being able to see you done extremely well. This one even explores some rare religious overtones and end-of-life rituals. During TNG's first run, I used to say this was my favorite episode as a kid. While I don't think it's quite that good now, it is worth a top 200 spot. Losing friends at 148. Sacrifice for nothing. Or Tears of the Prophets. Cisco kicks off Season 6's finale on a positive note by receiving the Chris Pike Medal of Honor. It's pretty much all downhill from here, despite the hopeful mood of Jadzia that she and Worf are trying to have a baby that will be difficult given the species gap. Alas, she won't make it out of the episode. Her plot armor runs out when actress Terry Farrell runs afoul of old Ricky Berman, and Ducat, with the power of the Pyraths, ends her life, closes the wormhole, and leaves all the orbs of the prophets dark. Meanwhile, Sisko and the Defiant are embroiled in the first battle of Chintaka, and he feels the prophet's silence, forcing Kira to take command and finish the job. 
The only thing I find weird is the concept of these orbital weapon platforms having a remote power source. I realize this is a franchise that runs on Technobabble, but we've never seen any explanation in Trek otherwise of wireless power, which would have a ton of drawbacks, if it's even possible. In the end, the Cisco loses faith and goes home to Louisiana to peel potatoes into the next season. One of the most emotional season finales in all of Trek. Setting aside prejudices at 147, Cold Warriors United. Or the enemy. Responding to a distress call from a remote, uninhabited world near the neutral zone, the Enterprise finds a Romulan crash survivor from a small craft. Jordy falls into a hole and he's left on the surface between transport windows, and upon climbing out, is taken prisoner by another Romulan survivor, only for the two to find that they're both experiencing disabilities due to the atmosphere on this planet, and help each other get out of the sticky situation they're in. There's a clear Cold War analogy here, broadcast during the final year of the Soviet Union before collapse. It's probably also Geordi's best episode to center around. Thankfully, it had nothing to do with romance. Speaking with the gods at 145 and 146, Destiny Calling, or Emissary Parts 1 and 2. Everything has to start somewhere, and apparently for DS9, going back to an event we only saw the aftermath of in TNG in the form of the Battle of Wolf 359 and a tech scroll? Because somehow we needed that. This provides us with the first appearance of John Hertzler as Cisco's former captain. And we find out the key event in Ben's life that this episode centers around, in the death of his wife. After hearing about Bajor many times in TNG, we finally get to see it just after the Cardassians pull out aboard the Federation's newest hunk of space metal to administer. Ben finds out he's going to be the one to reunite the Bajoran people with their gods, so no pressure there in the next seven seasons. But before that, he's got to get his hands dirty and learn to get along with his hostile witness of a first officer, Major Kira and her not-so-dialed-in hair. Speaking of not-dialed-in, Dr. Bashir steps off the shuttle to his initial posting with a weird over-eagerness that will need to be dialed back over the next few seasons. When Ben finds the wormhole, the prophets help him put his life back together, rather than him living his life still watching his wife die and blaming Picard. The episode does maybe the best of any Trek starter at doing a pilot's key job of introducing our characters and giving us reasons to care about all of them. Even the minor characters that could have just as easily been never seen again like Nog start a redemption arc as a common thief that's just a way for the writers to keep Quark on the station for time being. While a little over the top and hokey, this is nearly Trek's best first episode of a series. Two Emmys came out of this one, and even more nominations that are well-deserved. Crash Landing at 143 and 144, beginning of a long road. Or Broken Bow, parts 1 and 2. The award for Best Star Trek Pilot goes to Enterprise. While attached to a season 1 that gives TNG a run for its money in Bad Trek, its pilot does everything it needs to do and just a smidge better than DS9, in that its characters are more dialed in from episode one, with the exception of maybe Archer. I buy them as characters that they are by the end of the show and not just a TV character that needs tweaking. From Johnny Archer's early days painting model ships with his warp theorist father, to the day he launches Earth's first deep space warp 5 prototype, we're introduced to an explorer whose naivete and curiosity will provide four seasons of misadventure and some decidedly Trek content. The rest of the cast is well-rounded also, though Phlox's super smile is some super scary as hell 2000s effects. The crew is charged with taking a near-dead Klingon to Kronos, despite protest from their Vulcan observers. Along the way, they get caught up in the Suliban kidnapping him, 
Archer uses what limited resources he has to get him back and deliver his coded DNA intel back to his homeworld. This pilot sets up a recurring villain frenemy in John Fleck Silic and does a great job getting the NX-01 out into the galaxy as they seek a ton of new life. A truly great start to an overall middle-of-the-road show that gets much better toward the end of its run. Ah, computer! That program is available. Thanks, Major! A ternary system consisting of twin O-type companions. Impulse system overload. Auto shutdown in 12 seconds. Come full circle and there's no way out. But funk is existentially 